America Meditating Radio Show, we collect wisdom, inspire each other, and empower hearts 24-7. Hi, I'm Sister Jenna. Join me and guest on Blog Talk Radio as we amplify stories that compel us to be more for ourselves and everyone else around us. Hello, everyone. This is Sister Jenna from the America Meditating Radio, and I'm excited to introduce to you Meditate the Vote. It's going to be a national campaign, and what we're asking for all of you to join us with is to raise the bar of conversation. Try to see in what way we can change our interpretation about who we are, what we are, and perhaps the direction in which we want this country to go in. Regardless of whoever becomes the next president in 2017, we are still responsible for the way that we want to move our lives. So could you join me and an alliance of friends around the country to meditate the vote? Go to americameditating.org, press on Events, Meditate the Vote, and you'll be able to get a whole bunch of information. So join us, because I, Sister Jenna, meditate the vote. Write thank you notes. Tell the truth all the time. These motivating thoughts from Randy Pausch's last lecture remind each of us to live our dreams. Be creative every day. Take a fun trip. Motivation. Pass it on from the Foundation for a Better Life at values.com. Do you like to meditate? Have you tried to meditate? Have you struggled with meditation? Why don't you visit one of the Brahma Kumaris Meditation Center? Visit brahmakumaris.org. Blaylock Dialysis Center is a convenient state-of-the-art dialysis center in the Houston area, run by Dr. Panakin Patel. Relax in a comfortable environment while receiving quality care. Serving adults 18 to geriatrics, we are here to help you. Call 713-463-6611 for more information or visit us at our website at www.blaylockdialysiscenter.com. Blaylock Dialysis Center, where helping you get well is our priority. From the old to the young, we hold life and death on our tongues. Buried there within the warmth of our breath lies our outcome. In comes thoughts that are hung by our mainframes. It seems that the same things we stitch on our end scenes is seen in the scenes our words paint. We spit fire, blow off steam, become things that we ain't. Our words either build, heal, or obliterate. Our words lift us, break us, paint us, stain us. Intention is written, spoken, our hearts are either healed or broken. Often we lose to the contest of context. Our minds are hypnotized, conned by text. We breathe life into what we think we can't. We are who we say we are. If you say you are a star, chances are you probably are. Our steps are laid out by our mantras. Affirmations are claimed in conversation. We steer down the lanes of our language. Our bodies follow. Strength is borrowed or lost depending on what we believe. Opinions become the nucleus of our minds, dominions. Words do have power. Words do have power. Words do have power. The same way the world has cowards. We're faced by fear. Like sponges, we embrace what we hear. For some, our blues become our blueprints, those who spent, those who spend all day thinking about others' thoughts give those thoughts value. They become our laws, our futures are dictated by what we dream. We're beautified or bullied by what we believe. What you spoke glues your hopes to your soul. We feed on our inner visions becoming what we think, regurgitating the negativity, the positivity. We are what we speak.
Welcome, everyone, to America Meditating Radio. I'm your host, Sister Jenna, and we have the wonderful fortune of listening to one of Jay Ivey's poet, the number one hip-hop poet declared by Russell Simmons, B.E.T., and even the, the narrative for the Muhammad Ali movie. So just a very, very dear friend of ours, and we continue to wish Jay Ivey and his beautiful wife all the very best. As you know, they've had a letter-writing campaign for fathers, especially for individuals who were raised without fathers, and also just the whole journey towards forgiveness, which is so timely and so important at this time. Hope you liked the plug that I gave for Meditate the Vote. As you know, it's something very near and dear to my heart. But I also feel it's something that we are sensing for ourselves, this call to empower our own lives. And I can't begin to tell you how appreciative I feel of what I'm witnessing in our political campaign and what we've been hearing and just receiving on the news, if we're taking it in fully, that we are really being ushered an opportunity to rise and we are no longer going to perhaps just make excuses for whatever's happening in the world. But right now, we're the ones that have to step up. Each one of us individually have to check ourselves to see to what extent I'm being true I'm being sacred and I'm honoring my journey and my own path. And what better of a conversation am I going to have than with my incredible brother, Stephen Dynan. Stephen Dynan is a noted social entrepreneur and visionary political strategist and the founder and CEO of the Shift Network. It's a leading global provider of online transformational courses and trainings, and he was previously a senior staffer for both the Institute of Noetic Sciences and the Esalen Institute. Stephen is the author of Radical Spirit, Spiritual Writings from the Voices of Tomorrow, and his new book, where we had the fortune of hosting Stephen at the Meditation Museum just recently, his new book called Sacred America, Sacred World, world, fulfilling our mission and service to all who I had the fortune of handing it to one of the senior advisors for President Obama. So I'm hoping that that got some sort of a mention or reviewing. Stephen, we're keeping our fingers crossed on that. And Stephen is also a member of the prestigious Transformational Leadership Council and Evolutionary Leaders Group as well. Today, we're proud to welcome our wonderful brother, Stephen Dynan. Om Shanti, welcome. Om Shanti, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. You know, I'm excited because I know I'd gotten an email about the book, and I wanted to know how is it doing so far. I mean, it's got to have been a huge learning curve to be having this book out at this particular time. Yes. Well, you know, I don't have the final sales stats, but I think it's done pretty well this month. And and I think most importantly, I feel like is the reception it's gotten. I've had so many people, including radio hosts who are kind of old, you know, grizzled veterans of the political scene, (laughs) saying it's the most hopeful book they've seen in years or most important book they've seen in years. And, you know, I've had so many people write me just saying how much it's touched and moved them and opened them in different ways. So the thing with the book is, you know, people don't read as much these days, but when they do, it's such, it can be such a transformational journey. And so I'm really just heartened by the number of people who have been touched and moved to get more engaged and to engage politics in a way that's more evolutionary. Exactly. You know, well, maybe it might be food for thought to put it into an audio format because it's true. People are running, exercising on the go, and they just want to listen to things now. And I think it's a powerful read, as you know that already. You say that America has a sacred purpose. And, you know, we usually go to India or we go to Bali or we go somewhere (laughs) to find our own sacred calling. And here, Stephen Dynan is saying that America has a sacred purpose. Can you educate our listeners, and what is that purpose? Hmm. Well, it's funny because oftentimes we like to go elsewhere. It's more exotic to sort of find <laughs> find the holy elsewhere, travel to India or, or whatever. And sometimes we forget that, you know, really everything is sacred, that that's part of what um, so many indigenous traditions have taught us, as well as those from the East, is that when we see the world with the eyes of the divine, it's like we see the sacred in all things. And so, of mm-hmm. course, America is also sacred. And of course, there's a higher reason for its creation. And you can see that it's not hidden. It's really in the founding principles things like liberty and equality and justice for all are are there really high sacred principles that can guide us in, into a higher expression of ourselves personally but also collectively so i really see us as as an example of 
creating a, a political system that can liberate more of our, our potential and as a template for really modeling what's possible on this planet. That may sound idealistic given some of the level of dysfunction we now see and some of the, the level of political polarization and breakdown. But the truth is that the American experiment in democracy has inspired so much upliftment around the world and so much advancement of the human condition. And now it's really our opportunity to go to the next level of that. And so breakdowns are, are also opportunities for breakthroughs to another level. So with all, this political season is, is definitely one of the most contentious, most divisive, most wildest mm-hmm. rides, frankly, that we've ever seen. And it's also an opportunity for us to shake out certain of the old ossified patterns and really go to another level. So that's part of why I wanted my book to come out this year, to chart a pathway to that next possibility, what I call America 7.0, which is a a truly global operating system, one where we have the foundation of sacred reverence for all, that we apply that in the political arena, and we also activate our service to the larger whole of planet Earth. So the phrase e pluribus unum in many ways Mm -hmm. encapsulates so much of that next evolution is out of many one. So when we're we're leading towards more oneness, towards more unity, towards more of a unification, not just for America, but for the world, that is ultimately connected to this higher purpose for America. Mm-hmm. That sounds so beautiful and so idealistic. And, and as an angel's advocate, right? Do you think that America really ever had that? Or is it that we have consistently or maybe we have allowed history or all the various scenes that we've endured or maybe just the multitude of how the country is built by the voices of many cultures and many backgrounds. Is this something that you have envisioned that America will move towards, Stephen? Or do you think we once had it, lost it, regaining it again? Well, I, I don't think we ever really fully had it. I mean, obviously, we were founded on slavery, and women were not enfranchised to vote. And we, we've had to make a long journey just to get to the point where people are fully enfranchised and we have the level of equality that we have. So the sacred principles that we were created with weren't fully enacted. And so we're always having to seek out how do we f- express those on another level. However, mm-hmm. what we do find is that there is that impulse that's throughout. You see it in the Statue of Liberty as bring us your poor, your huddled masses right. yearning to breathe free. It's like there's a deep generosity of spirit that has also been part of the American experiment that is that has brought more people together and that has guided us towards creating more and more of a global village. One of the, the great things mm-hmm. about the tour that I was on was just visiting places that I didn't, I didn't realize just what a global village places like Atlanta are. You know, it's like mm. there's tons of people from India, there's people from Africa, there's like, it's more of our cities are a global village than, than I was even aware of, you know, and I think that that's, that whether you're in D.C. or New York or Atlanta or the San Francisco, there's a very real sense where we are modeling the healthy engagement of all the world cultures and all the world religions in miniature, probably more so than any other country in the world, is that we are really becoming the global village in miniature. And that is the expression of e pluribus unum. That is the expression of, of healthy diversity. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that very much. Now, in your book, you talk about this fast-growing transpartisan movement, right? What is meant by a transpartisan or partisanism? Because I know that for many of us in the country who have kind of taken it very easy and laid back, this political campaign has been waking people up, and I think a lot of people are also learning things that they didn't even know was even there. So could you educate mm-hmm. our listeners on what is a transpartisan movement? What is that? about? Well, transpartisan ultimately recognizes that our identity and commitments have to be larger than our party affiliation. So we can be a Democrat, we can be a Republican or a Libertarian or Green, but that we are or independent. And But our identity is grounded in something larger. It's more unified. So it's grounded in being human beings and American citizens and ultimately global citizens. So that there is that unity that helps to hold the diversity together. Because if we're just in our partisan identities, basically we are in the diversity, we're in the many of e pluribus unum, but we're not focused on the oneness. And so when mm-hmm. a transpartisan is committed to certain principles of engagement that have to do with respect and honoring different perspectives and a recognition that political diversity is part of our source of strength and that we want to be able to engage political diversity and different viewpoints in a way that's really growthful and honoring. But that means treating people with the dignity that they everybody deserves, right. even if they have very different viewpoints, even if they're not necessarily treating us with dignity. When we treat them with dignity, it helps 
to uplift. You know, Gandhi is obviously one of our great teachers in, in this arena is that he really showed that it wasn't enough to simply overpower the British. It had to awaken the conscience of the British such that they didn't want to rule in India anymore. And so there, there's a way in, of engaging across divides that actually uplifts both sides. I like that very much. There's so many challenges taking place. America's really not on its own. Everywhere there is something consciously emerging, and I keep saying this in everything that I share on a platform. We are being signaled. Turn inwards. You are the solution. We are being signaled. So what do you see that we are shifting towards politically and globally, looking at the whole world and knowing America's vast influence on the narrative in the whole world, what's actually taking place when you look at it from Stephen Dynan's mind? We're becoming one unified global people. We're restoring mm-hmm. the remembrance that we are one sacred family here on this planet and that all of the different skin colors and cultures and you know boundaries and they're all a bit artificial that ultimately there's this deep interconnection at the very heart of humanity and that's what we're now in the process of remembering and awakening to and mm-hmm. we we see that happening and then that reflects in how we engage each other we're, we're traveling more there's there's global media there's global finance and trade that we're more and more interconnected and so the boundaries are getting softening between us culturally, religiously, mm-hmm. spiritually. And so and then politically is often the one that's the lagging indicator. It's not the leading indicator. It's sort of <laughs> bringing up the rear, but and we sometimes go backwards. So like the European Union is a great example where we used to have very fierce borders and very fierce rivalries between cultures that manifested fully in wars and now it's it's got its challenges and problems, but it still has been a a, a relatively healthy and non-warring example of how to bring 20 plus nations together. So I think that, you know, there, we're seeing more regional block, African Union coming together, Southeast Asian Union. There's ways of like different accords are moving us to more and more synergy and fewer boundaries. So the mm-hmm. natural end result of this is for us to become a unified people on the world. And that's how we ultimately end war. That's how we move beyond the divides that have been so painful and so Hello devastating there. for us. You know, it fascinates me, Stephen, that uh, here we are thousands of years later, and we've read in history both, we have heard from our grandparents just what hate and what fear can do. And yet it perplexes me that we still grapple with the same narrative that we've heard thousands of years ago. You told me a beautiful story when you were here at the museum about your undying love for Sarah Palin. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, everyone, let me let me just make you privy to what that actually meant was he was about to rip his hair out whenever he would hear Sarah Palin. And then what happened was he said, no, I can't do this. I have to rise above this. I have to love her. Russia is, you cannot see Russia from Alaska. <laughs> and so, you know, what I'm saying is that you have been through your own process, right? You've witnessed, you know, being very engaged in the country and wanting to see a difference. And when you see the leadership emerging and you feel like, oh, come on, do not take us for fools, do not take advantage of us, you say that you're a progressive who has learned a lot from conservative values. But what are some of the lessons that you've taken away from across the aisle now? Because you've had to open up yourself more to going beyond the limitations of some of these these leaders yeah. that we're witnessing today. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think there, there's all sorts of things, lessons to be learned. I, I feel like being willing to make more conservative decisions about finances, for instance, and being less, uh, you know, at times needing to be more contained and more disciplined about finances. That was something that didn't come early, come easy to me. I wanted to have like everything's abundance and flow, and and you know, and, and launching <laughs> a business, it's it's good to learn not that easy, sometimes yeah. it's, sometimes not spending money is better than spending money, and that you have to have um, some cash reserves, and you have to sometimes be circumspect about whether things are really going to work out. So there's a certain level of judgment, sort of having a having a certain level of conservative quality and temperament that can be helpful as a right. leader of an organization. And I think that there's also a way of also respecting certain boundaries with, um, you know, to give an example like that's more a little further out, is like in our circles, there's a lot of people who experiment with what's called polyamory in uh, in California, where these people, you know, don't have just a monogamous connection. They experiment with opening up to other people. And mostly you see train wrecks coming out of that. <laughs> and so there's a way in which a uh, more conservative value system and conservative morality and committing to somebody for a lifetime and having the discipline around that. And the, there's a beauty and power in that. And I think that this so 
sometimes the free flow of energy and experimentation can sometimes lead to destruction too. And so, mm-hmm. you know, I, I like to go to a thing like Burning Man, but you know, it's not how, necessarily how we build a healthy chair. It's like it's a, it's a balance of this kind of free flow of more uh, more artistic, experimental kind of energy, you. and then the kind of the commitments and the fa- you know the rigor and and the, for instance, raising children. I think it's very beautiful to have just a really solid moral foundation on which to grow up. And so, you know, I think that I there's that. there's important truths in the conservative value system there. And I think that, you know, in general, I, there's a wisdom that we have to preserve the best of what's gotten us to where we are. So in our society, mm-hmm. it's like we Say want to again, honor our... There's a wisdom in preserving the absolute best where we've gotten us to where we are. Beautiful, so in our beautiful. Culture, in our culture, it's like conservatives are often focused more on preserving law and order and societal institutions and traditions and lineages. And those things really, it's, you know, we're, we're building upon the past. We're not just overthrowing the past. And sometimes progressives can get a little willy-nilly about just, you know, throwing the whole thing out and saying, we got to rewrite all the codes of who we are. And, and that's not actually necessarily how evolution happens best. So there's a way of honoring tradition, honoring our lineages, honoring the social structures and rules and order, and working within the system to evolve it rather than just saying. Brilliant. Stephen, if you were president, what would you do to shift the state of the country? Well, I think there's a bunch of things structurally I go into the book. So I, I feel like we do need to get the money out of politics. You know, we need a constitutional amendment to get uh, overturned Citizens United because there's very much uh, a sense of which you know political leaders want most of them are getting in there because they wanted they want to be of service to the greater whole but the system has become right. so distorted and there's so much focus on raising the money that it's required to stay in power that that it has an intrinsically distorting effect so we'd have to shift that mm-hmm. and shift around the the um shift around the whole gerrymandering and have a, like a really objective perhaps even computer generated process of decide on congressional districts rather than putting turning it into a political football that's also creating a lot mm-hmm. more unnecessary polarization and bogging down the country there I think those things those are some structural changes that need to happen there's also just I would refocus the mission of the of the United States to make it really explicitly about creating a world at peace. And the reason for that is it's a more unifying and aspirational and positive mission for us versus conducting a war on terror, which mm. can, you know, military engagement to protect and prevent terrorism, I think is a viable use of our national military. However, if that's the focus and we're not focusing on the larger mission, which is to create a world at peace, then we're not necessarily doing those things that help to seed the long-term shifts and changes that do create a world at peace. And the truth is, most people in the military, they ultimately want to see a peaceful world as well. So we're just lifting the aspiration and putting the focus on that and bringing in more of the peace-building work that is, is central to really shifting things in the long term. So I'd say Beautiful. that I would say that implementing a what I call a carbon responsibility fee it would be really helpful as a global thing because it basically accelerates innovation in the direction of lower impact, you know, averting climate change. So it's like if there's a fee that goes back into green innovations and things that offset carbon, then as a national level, we could drive innovation in that sector much more quickly and move towards a new world. So I think there's shifts in banking system. Eventually, I would love to see us dissolve the federal reserve system and really create a mm-hmm. the United States public bank that basically is funding infrastructure and print and you know creating the money supply and is, and funding the infrastructure of this country but the profits of that accrue to the American people rather than right now the American people pay money pay interest on the money that is created by a pri- essentially a private interest. And so there's some things that need to happen on on those levels as well. So there's a lot of shifts that are required. Oh. And it's not right. the easiest necessarily to move these things forward, but I think that if you activate the, the vision of what wants to happen and show that there's actually more possibility in left and right to come together on some of the structural shifts that can free up our democracy, then I think that we could really get some traction. Mm, wow. We vote for you, Stephen, because even as I'm listening to you, I was thinking from a very, very dreamy point of view, which I very rarely ever do. Wouldn't it be amazing <laughs> for Stephen to really actually start with folks who would actually want to create like this little bubble of this other world within this world and actually see how it works? Because I think some of the ideas that you just mentioned are groundbreaking and yet seem so simple to solve if everyone's heart was in the picture. But there's so much lack of trust 
that every time you do come up with something good for the whole, there's always someone or a few that feel like you're going to either take advantage of them or they are in that circle to take advantage of you. And so how do you break down this energy of distrust that seems to be a veil around the country and around the world? Because Whenever I walk into a relationship and you just sense that energy of distrust, no matter what you do, it just doesn't work. But whenever you and another folks like your team at Shift Network and all the other things that you're doing, there's just that trust factor. Stuff just happens. I see that with my team because there's such a trust energy here. We just make things work. But if there's one person that we feel like, wow, be careful, red mark, it just breaks in. It it makes everything stop or it slows down. Is there any anything that you could offer our conversation as we get to a close. What can we do to build more trust in ourselves and in the country? Well, that's where this whole principle of political cross-training comes in. It's like, first of all, Mm. to recognize where do our biases come in instead of blaming the other to say, okay, how is it that I'm showing up in a way that might diminish trust? So Mm. I was on a panel in in, in Cleveland at the Purple Tent with Grover Norquist, and we were talking about gun issues. And so what was most revelatory for me was just the extent to which the Second Amendment proponents and people on the right, and he's a member of the NRA, don't trust the liberals around this issue. And, And the assumption is that liberals are just saying one thing, but underneath they really just want to confiscate guns. And so there's mm-hmm. this kind of deep distrust. And so, you know, I was just listening to that and saying, like, how do we actually get in there? And some of it is through listening, through respectful engagement, through shifting our, from seeing people as bad people that are out to get us to, to people who ha- are sincerely motivated by what they see as is going to really be helpful to our country. And so when we can do that on a personal level, I did the, my whole, you know, deprogramming around really disliking or hating uh, Sarah Palin to a place where I could really, (laughs) really embrace her in my heart. You know, I think that all of us have to do some of that work. And so when I, this summer, when I traveled to the Republican National Convention and the Democratic National Convention, it was partially as an exercise for me to be able to fully embrace and not polarize against Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when we do that in our own heart, it opens up more portals to, for collaborative engagement. It can happen just in a marriage. It can happen in a family. It can happen in a community where we just yeah. take the time to, instead of spouting our opinions, to take a deeper listening. To And when we do engage, we engage thoughtfully with, with respect and with honor. And then when, that helps to soften because the, the thing most people are, react to is being disrespected on a deeper level. And there's a reason for that spiritually. When somebody acts towards us in a way that is disrespecting our fundamental identity, we don't want to take that in because that actually programs a sort of a negative self conception mm-hmm. in us. So so we, we naturally armor up. So yeah. how are we being judgmental or diminishing, disrespectful, and then uh, and to you know not we have to give ourselves cut ourselves some slack because we're coming out of a culture that's very much doing that all the time. So we don't want to judge ourselves for for what we're doing, but just noticing it's like where am I really demonizing people and where am I diminishing them in some way? And that's going to be exactly where it's hard to break through. So if we have to we have to do the internal work to shift that to restore that sense of oneness and respect, and then I think when we engage from that place a lot more can happen. So I can be on a panel with Grover Norquist and be genuinely curious about how do we make some shifts in the gun debate in this country. And, you know, we can do this on a, on a personal level by having living room conversations with people of very different political perspectives or family level. And to start with the deeper listening and to share our own opinions as our own opinions, not as facts, but as our own perspective and to do so with, with respect for the other. Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant. Stephen Dynan, thank you so much for joining us on the air today. I could talk to you for ions, but before I let you go, where can we find information on the book and are there any upcoming events that you've got happening on the Shift Network? Bob, it's good to get on two different places, sacredamerica.net. That gets you the loop on the book, and we have a whole series with different leaders that are featured in the American Evolution series. And also at the Shift mm-hmm. Network, we always have lots of great events happening. We just completed a American Citizen Summit, which is showcasing transpartisan pioneers. So you can get on that at americancitizensummit.com, or the, and the shiftnetwork.com gets you into our system so you can hear about all the great events coming up. Beautiful, beautiful. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us on the air, and you always have a home here in D.C. when you come back. Yay. Love it. Thank you so much for your (laughs) beautiful work. All right. Bye-bye. You're welcome. All blessings. Bye-bye.
What an interesting way of looking at the way that we could shift our political system. And I think that we need to start to listen to these voices more. Marion Williamson is another one, where we need to start to educate ourselves as to how best we actually can contribute to this current narrative and not be stuck in this sort of a polarizing energy and allowing ourselves to think that we have permission to keep coming from that place because it really isn't serving our greater self or our higher yourself. It's definitely not fostering an, a language of trust or an experience of trust. So for further information on Stephen Dynan's book, Sacred America, Sacred World, Fulfilling Our Mission in Service to All, please go to sacredamerica.net slash special and feel free to visit stephendynan.com. You've been listening to America Meditating Radio and I'm your host, Sister Chenna. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation with Stephen Dynan. I know that I did. And as we, you know, look at ourselves, we realize that we've got a lot of work to do and it makes us, I guess, enthused, enthused. I think that we are intrigued about the shifts that we find our lives in and how we can forget something that seemed so clear to us at one point and how we can remember things that we need to forget. Consciousness continues to keep stirring around and we are witnessing that in this political campaign and in our country, just even globally. But there is definitely benefit in every scene, and the benefit is know yourself, connect to the Supreme Source, perform actions that give joy and not sorrow. Don't give sorrow and don't take sorrow. I believe that if we continue to create that narrative, something will change in our, on our planet. No one can take away your happiness unless you give them permission, and we are here to love each other the same, so let's do that. I'd like to end today's show with a message home, my bliss. Take care, everyone. Why?